Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Craig Fugate, the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the Obama administration. With resources already strained and attention focused on the COVID-19 pandemic, they discuss the dangers of adding another natural disaster, like a hurricane or a wildfire, to the mix. Let's listen. Craig Fugit, thank you so much for joining me. It's my pleasure. So the COVID uh, pandemic is upon us, and now so is the Atlantic hurricane season. And I wanted to talk to you as someone with lots of experience with hurricanes and other natural disasters about how this coming season may be a lot worse given the COVID pandemic we're experiencing. Are folks, uh, emergency managers, are they too busy to deal with uh, a hurricane that could come this way? No, they've been thinking about this uh, since uh, early spring. Uh, you know, I, I live here in Florida. I know the folks up at Florida Emergency Management, and uh, they've been actually thinking through what they're going to have to do differently with COVID as they get ready for hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So one thing I think about, I used to live in Florida myself, and I think about, you know, you get evacuated and you go to a shelter and there's lots and lots of people there. So not really the greatest place to do social distancing. So I'm curious um, your take on that. Well, our recommendations for people who do live in evacuation zones when those orders are given is to plan ahead. Uh, One of the best things you can do is relocate with friends or family that are inland. Uh, Again, know them, uh, smaller interactions. It's a much better situation for a lot of people to go to friends and families. And with COVID, it reduces exposure. The second thing we've recommended is go to hotels and motels. And for a lot of people, that is a good option. Uh, Because of the economic impacts, it's going to be a real struggle financially for folks. So FEMA and the states are actually looking at how do we utilize a lot of hotels and motels that have vacancies right now kind of unusual in Florida as we go into peak tourist season, but we do have a lot of vacancies, and utilize hotels and motels as shelters and help get people to safe locations. And then Red Cross and other groups have been working on how to operate shelters with social distancing. And I'm going to give you a clue. One thing you need to add to your disaster supply kits and your evacuation kits, mask, because we know we're going to have to uh, have people wearing masks, particularly when Uh, There are certain activities that are going on in the shelter to minimize uh, exposure. Mm -hmm. I've been in those shelters, um, and I wonder if there are a lot of people who might be afraid, given the orders to social distance, if they'll be afraid to evacuate into shelters. Well, this is what we got to be clear about. Uh, When we evacuate, uh, these are primarily coastal areas that are subject to flooding, storm surge, The risk there is drowning, and water by far is the leading cause of death from hurricanes, from anything else, uh, far outweighs wind and other things. And so we're we're talking about evacuating from a a known life risk. And in the shelters, they're taking a lot of steps. First of all, they're opening up more shelters and having fewer people. They're increasing the square footage. They're changing their intake process to screen people who may have been exposed or do have COVID, so they go somewhere else that's safe. And they're looking at how to practice not only social distancing, but other things such as wearing masks, how they're going to feed, how they're going to have people sleep in a way that minimizes that. But what I don't want people to do is to be so afraid of COVID that they don't evacuate and put themselves and their families at risk of drowning. Mm -hmm. Is that a real concern? It is. After Hurricane Ivan hit uh, uh, Pensacola in 2004, uh, 
I had an opportunity to listen to some of the 911 calls of people who didn't evacuate down on Pensacola Beach. And they were frantically calling to be rescued, but it was too late. It, the storm was too close. They couldn't send responders out. And all the 911 operators could do was, you know, tell them to get as high as they can. They noted the address and they would try to get out there as soon as the storm passed. Mm -hmm. And those are people who decided that it was better. They were better off staying at home. And it turned out not to be the case. Yeah, they put it wasn't only them. In many cases, they had their families at risk. And then the responders who were going out during the storm trying to get to people. So it's important that if you're in the evacuation zone, you plan ahead. Friends and families, hotels and motels. And if you're going to a shelter, you know, pack your supplies and always take your pets with you because Again, we're, we're evacuating from water. This is a significant life threat for you and your animals. Don't leave them behind. Plan now. Don't wait until the storm threatens. That's where we see a lot of people get in trouble. So identify if you're in an evacuation zone, know where you're going to go, and add those supplies to your kit, the mask, the gloves, the hand sanitizer, and the wipes, so you have supplies when you do go. Mm -hmm. Are there... Um, are there other things that uh, state and local emergency managers are thinking about given the realities of COVID and the potential for a pretty rough hurricane season? Yeah, one of the things that we've been talking about uh, is this idea that when we move a lot of responders and a lot of volunteers, that's actually the vector. You know, people spread this. This isn't like Zika where it was mosquitoes. People spread. So the more I move people, the greater my risk are. So I got to evacuate people. Ideally, I want to go tens of miles and not hundreds of miles. But then how do I respond to it? We know we're going to have to bring in utility crews. We know we're going to have to bring in search and rescue crews. But a lot of what we do in disasters in mass care, we may be able to utilize local folks more effectively. We've seen this with feeding in the COVID environment. Instead of bringing in a lot of folks from the outside, hire local restaurants to prepare meals to be fed out to people that can't get in. Um, so one of the things we've been talking about, and this is something that FEMA will reimburse for, and they have for COVID already, is where you can't contract locally for services such as feeding people and hire people in that area to do some of the work that we would traditionally bring people from the outside to do and minimize moving people. But more importantly, we also can put people back to work that are currently unemployed. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a really interesting point about uh, the responders, because I know that I've seen, um, you know, as you're leaving, you see uh, utility trucks from from a, a lot of states around bringing in, set, getting in place in order to help once the storm's over. Um, but the point about them being vectors is really important. Yeah, and again, if you talk to the electrical industry, they say, you know, we're going to send crews in, but it's going to be slower. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have to practice all of the protective measures to keep the crew safe while they're putting power back up. Uh, so they said, you know, we're going to respond, but it may be a delay. It won't be as fast as we could uh, in a non-COVID environment. You know, we're going to bring in a lot of crews, whether it's hurricanes or fighting fires, but they're going to try to keep the crews together that come from different parts of the country versus intermingling them. And again, practicing wearing the mask, the hand washing, and all the other stuff to minimize spread. And then a lot of testing among those folks so that if you do have anybody who's exposed, you know, quickly you know, get that under control. Mm -hmm. I guess you really need fast tests for that to be a feasible option. This is short of a vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the most important thing is to speed up testing, availability of testing, and fast testing. And, and until we get to that point, our best defense is wearing a mask. And that's why... You know, for the 2020 hurricane season, you know, add mask to your disaster supplies yeah. because if you got to leave, even if you're home, and if you if you've ever been in an after hurricane environment with all the stuff that's around the mold and stuff, wearing a mask is not a bad idea, even without COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Another thing I was just thinking about is sort of that when the uh, when there's not enough when the water supply is effective, um, hand washing becomes more challenging. Absolutely, and that's why again. Uh, stocking up on those things. And, and again, these are things that have always kind of been in the kits. You'll see dust mask in there. You'll see hand sanitizer in there. But I think COVID's really emphasizing we want to have a uh, mask. We particularly want to make sure that we have masks for everybody in the family. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we have to evacuate and go somewhere mm -hmm. uh, or we're having to go to the shelter, make sure we take masks with us. 
Mm -hmm. uh, states are stockpiling masks for those shelters, but you always want to make sure you have your supplies just in case. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Atlantic hurricanes are a big deal, but they're not the only disaster that we can face in the time of COVID. We're coming up on wildfire season. Uh, we're in tornado season. Um, again, are these, um, I guess these bring extra challenges when COVID's around. Yeah, again, I think it, you have to break this down. We're not going to fundamentally change a lot of things. In wildfires, uh, you know, we're still going to have to have evacuations. Uh, we're still going to have to fight the fires. But we're going to also have to practice a lot of different things to make sure we're minimizing spread. So uh, within the wildland fire community, the, the national agencies, the U.S. Forest Service, others, uh, again, starting back in February, March, began looking at what kind of protocols they would have to have so the firefighters could deploy, but they could also protect them and implement procedures to minimize the spread. Um, so we know disasters are going to happen. We know COVID is not going away anytime soon. So we're having to adjust to that. But the thing that's most important is we want to make sure that people that are in these threat zones, when local officials say it's time to evacuate, we, we really have to be careful. We've been emphasizing so much social distancing and staying home that people may be afraid to evacuate. Well, when these evacuation orders are issued, it's because your life is at risk. And that's an immediate threat. And so if we take precautions, we can safely evacuate shelter. But it means that you have to be ready to go. Uh, and I think this is the, the thing that's most concerning about uh, these types of uh, emergencies is we've been telling people to stay home, isolate, particularly people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, and if you think of Florida with elderly, you think of some of the wildfires in California. We know that the elderly have a disproportionate risk of loss of life from these events. They're also in some of the highest risk groups for COVID. So I think this is part of the communication challenge. We have to be clear that when these evacuation orders are being issued, why people need to evacuate, the urgency to that, and acknowledging that COVID is there, but this is the most immediate life threat you're facing. Mm -hmm. Craig Fugit, thank you so much for joining me. That's my pleasure. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.